The Dubuchin Foundation is a U.S.-based, independent, nonprofit organization whose goal is to develop a cure for Dupuytren disease. And toward that end, one of our uh, biggest projects is the International Dupuytren Data Bank, which is an international research uh, project studying patients longitudinally um, and should be launching in the immediate future. I'm just going to review some of the concepts and methods involved with setting this up. First concept is the difference between surgical research and chronic disease research. Surgical research tends to be about the procedure or product or intervention uh, and refining that, defining indications for it, expanding indications for it, uh, and the metric that you use to assess tends to be procedure related. Whereas chronic diseases are chronic diseases because there's not an effective treatment. And that's often because the core biology is not understood. Sound familiar? So chronic disease research tends to be more about trying to figure out what questions to ask to find the, the root cause of the disease and to try to assemble clinical data to point you in the direction of, of how the disease actually affects people. And that winds up being in quality of life issues and tends to be longitudinal and open-ended. Dupuytren disease is a chronic progressive disease with some surgical aspects. And the IDDB is going to approach research of it uh, as one would approach chronic disease research. So the first stumbling block is that we don't have a unique biomarker. We don't have a way to definitively uh, tell by something other than clinical examination whether a person has or does not have Dupuytren disease or has or does not have the risk for Dupuytren disease with a number on it. We also don't have a pharmacologic target in terms of developing a disease modifying treatment. We have targets to treat, we have targets to treat the end effect but not the, not the underlying disease. So we need to correlate clinical disease patterns versus biomarkers and we need to uh, correlate medications that people are currently taking versus whether or not it affects their, the natural history of disease because it's much cheaper to repurpose an existing medication and to take leads from existing medications than to try to develop one um, from scratch. The big stumbling block here is we don't know the natural history of early or untreated Dupuytren disease. And so we need to do work to clarify the natural history subsets. We know a lot about what happens after you treat people, but we don't know much about what happens before you treat them. And we're going to focus on the aggressive disease subset. Now, the subsets of Dupuytren disease, since we don't have a biomarker, are clinical. And we do know that people show up with early changes in their palm that look like Dupuytren disease. There are two reasons why people get these kinds of changes. One is that there's a genetic risk. And two, there are exposure risks, including the exposure to time and epigenetic changes that occur there. And so people develop early changes of Dupuytren disease. They have bought the diagnosis. But then what happens after that is hard to predict. Does it get, go away? Sometimes it does. Nodules regress at least 10% of the time. D is it stable? D is it a problem that affects one finger and is cured for the lifetime with one procedure? Or is it something that goes on and on and on? Well, our concepts are uh, that the genetic version of Dupuytren disease tends to affect younger people. It tends to have associated conditions because it's a systemic disorder. People get frozen shoulder, letter hose, Peroni disease, and it tends to be more aggressive and treatment resistant, whereas the exposure factors, uh, epigenetic changes, diseases of old age, trauma, diabetes, tobacco, medications, tend to give a more benign version and people can develop these changes in their palm which doesn't necessarily progress to a disease which even needs treatment. That's the majority of patients. The majority of people with Dupuytren disease never need treatment. And so if you look at these numbers, you, we're talking about treatment and you look at numbers of, of 70 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 25 percent of white men over the age of 70 have Dupuytren disease. Well, what Dupuytren disease do they have? We, we need to work this out. We're going to focus on aggressive Dupuytren disease because that has the highest morbidity, highest morbidity from care, highest lifetime cost of care, and these are the people that have the highest failure rate from everything that we have to offer them. So 
we need to look at the natural history subsets. We have diathesis, but that doesn't really relate to quality of life, and quality of life is an issue with chronic disease research. So uh, a little story. I started doing percutaneous fasciotomy in 2003, and uh, because there was a need for it, within about a year, I was doing about 1,000 percutaneous fasciotomies a year. And that went on for some time until I, I closed my practice in, in 2012. And while I was doing this, I realized, gosh, I'm sitting on potential data mines, so I ought to record all this stuff. So I had a standard questionnaire asking people various things as they came in. And new patients coming in for treatment, about a, close to 1,000 years, were asked many questions, including this is the simplest possible question. How much does Dupuytren interfere with the use of your hand? I'd never heard of the patient evaluation measure at that point, and I just wanted to think, I thought, well, I should write this down so I can look at it later. So of my new patients who have charts that survived in a searchable format that I could search electronically, uh, I've got about 3,400 new patient intakes that were asked this question, and I plotted this number, most people fell between mild and moderate uh, over the course of time. And it's not really a, a dramatic curve up. And it turns out when you look at this, people who show up for treatment with a diagnosis less than a year tend to have other stuff going on. People who show up for treatment who've had Dupuytren disease for more than 15 years tend to have other things going on, more scatter in the data. So I, and 70% of people fall into the range of having a duration of diagnosis between one and 15 years. That's kind of the smoothest part of the plane. That's not a very impressive curve, but the question is what affects this curve? It's kind of a quality of life curve. You've had Dupuytren disease for a certain amount of time, how much does it bother you? Well, people who have age of onset under the age of 50 complained that their Dupuytren disease bothered them more than people who had a later age of onset. People who have a family history of Dupuytren disease, their hands bothered them more for any duration of disease than people who didn't have a known family history. People who had letter hose, their hands tended to bother them more than people who didn't. So this is a, a, a sign of a, uh, an aggressive subset of disease. Interesting thing about letter hose, going a little off track, was the clear correlation between early age of onset and the percentage of people that have letter hose, which clearly suggests to me that there's a biologic difference in people who have early age of onset that tend to have these systemic associated diseases versus older people who may have Dupuytren changes for another, from another etiology. I asked a couple, this is looking at other things that might impact quality of life. I asked everybody, uh, has your Dupuytren disease been painful? And not surprisingly, people who complained of pain also complained that their hand bothered them more. What was a little surprising was the number of people, these are all people coming in for treatment, who complained of pain in their Dupuytren disease. Depending on their age, 20 to 35% of people complained of pain. And additionally, it correlated with early age of onset. You know, old people have more pain in their hand than young people, and so this makes this even more significant. So that's something to follow in longitudinal studies and possibly as an index of disease aggressiveness. I was also impressed early on at the the number of people with nodular Dupuytren disease that complained of itching in their palm. And so I asked everybody, has your Dupuytren disease been itchy? Interestingly, people who had itching in their palm s said that the Dupuytren disease interfered more with the use of their hand. Even more interesting was the correlation between itching and age of onset. Biologically, there's some difference. And as, as Jagdeep has, has said, there, there is a relationship of immune cells uh, in addition to myofibroblasts, and itching is an immunologically related thing, and uh, so this leads to, to things that we can follow, as well as a way to segregate clinical disease types. Now, one other way of looking at this, interesting, the green line interfering less is people who either had, I'm sorry, who had both had er, a late age of onset and had no itching. Everybody else e who either had itching or had an early age of onset segregates into more interference, which means that they're possibly biologically distinct groups. So that's all interesting. But the next step is to take this curve and to look through to see what medications might affect it. Um, the biologically interesting medications in terms of Dupuytren biology are statins, angiotensin pathway drugs, calcium channel blockers, anti-TNF drugs, and people take a ton of over-the-counter supplements, which, which may or may not have an effect. And the question is, do any of these drugs 
change that curve? Well, the biggest demographic overlap in my patients was statins. 30% of the patients that I saw with Dupuytren disease were on statins. And if you look at this curve, the red line is people who were not on statins, their hands bothered them more than people with the blue line whose hands were on statins. It's not a simple question though because statins have an anti-inflammatory component to them and it might be that hyperlipidemia is one of those factors that is kind of an exposure factor that predisposes to more benign Dupuytren disease. So that it immediately becomes complicated. So I thought, well, one way to break this down is um, because the younger people tend not to be on statins to start with, is to uh, look at the subset of people here who have already had treatment before they were coming to me to have another treatment. So that means that you're looking at people that have maybe a little bit more aggressive disease. And when you look at that group, there's a fairly more clear spread between people who are not on statins, whose hands bother them more, than people who were on statins. So this points to possibly disease-modifying therapy or an additional treatment to add to conventional treatment. I looked at calcium channel blockers because of the implication of calcium in myofibroblast biology. The numbers are smaller on this. There's a little bit of a, of a trend toward hands bothering people less who are on calcium channel blockers, but uh, this needs to look, be looked at further. I looked at over-the-counter medicines, and the dark blue line in the middle of those lines is the average of everybody who's on or off of any kind of medicine. I asked specifically about glucosamine to all these patients because there's this internet buzz about glucosamine predisposing to Dupuytren disease, but I really didn't see uh, any trend with that. There was a, a uh, the other medicines that were taken commonly are omega-3 fatty acids, multiple vitamins, and aspirin. There was a possible uh, helpful trend in aspirin, anti-inflammatory, uh, but that may be for reasons other than Dupuytren biology. Now, so this is all kind of interesting stuff, and to look at this further, we need to look at much bigger numbers. So this is going, I was just look, rummaging through my data to try to find clues for what I might look at in a big longitudinal study. And to get large numbers, uh, the Dupuytren Foundation is working with the National Data Bank of Rheumatic Disease. The NDB has been conducting direct-to-patient online clinical surveys for the last 18 years for people who have rheumatoid arthritis and other chronic medical conditions. They're currently following about 20,000 patients, and they have the whole infrastructure set up. We are adding a Dupuytren wing onto their architecture so that we can do exactly the same thing. Also, uh, you may recall Pervalesco reported a validated self-diagnosis tool that people can diagnose their own Dupuytren disease by looking at pictures and, and answering a few questions and, and with a 95% specificity, we're going to incorporate that into the enrollment form. And this gives two great advantages. One, by going direct to patients, we can dodge the whole issue of having a physician practice-based registry uh, and all of the issues associated with that at big cost savings. The second, by, we can cast a much larger net because we can follow people who have early Dupuytren disease, who haven't seen a hand surgeon, who have diagnosed themselves or they've got a nodule, they've seen their internist, they've got a 15 degree contracture, they're not gonna see a doctor about it because their brother had a fasciectomy and they're never gonna have surgery. And so we can follow a much larger group of people, also at lower cost because it can all be done electronically. So here's a uh, version, we don't have the final version out yet, my programmer says about two weeks. On, um, on the left is uh, the type of picture used for a self-diagnosis form for people who uh, haven't seen a doctor, picture of nodule and, and cords for people to actually compare. On the right, following Joe Dias's work with the BSSH, of having the patient select from a group of pictures uh, the pattern of contracture which closely resembles uh, their most bent finger. And this allows us to get a uh, little stamp on contracture severity without bogging down in trying to get goniometric measurements at a distance, which is just a, a very difficult problem. We will follow long-term outcomes in longitudinal data by we're using a, a, uh, the patient evaluation measure incorporated into this to follow how people do over time, and people can log in the types of treatment that they've had and their uh, satisfaction and morbidity with that, and we're not going to be limited to any one 
treatment pattern. So we can track people who've had any type of treatment, uh, conventional or unconventional. When we have a critical mass, we will send out kits to collect blood samples for biomarker uh, collection. And we will have a uh, biobank that will store blood samples for analysis to share with researchers as part of this collaborative effort uh, and to uh, hold on to in case we come up with new ideas or new tests down the road. Here's our timeline. We are just about to launch. So we're enrolling patients and collecting core information with the enrollment form. Uh, we will follow that up with longitudinal surveys and we can have targeted surveys for people who are outliers for any of a number of conditions that we want to look into further. We'll, when we reach a critical mass of patients and critical mass of funding, we'll send out our biospecimen collection kits for DNA, serum MMPs, serum TIMPs, or anything else that you find interesting and would want to have in the bank. And then when we get enough of both of these columns, we can put them together, correlate clinical disease aggressiveness versus target genes, candidate biomarkers, medication history, and get more definitive information for a therapeutic target and, ther and drugs for either repurposing or drug development. Now, to do this, we need to recruit a lot of patients. Uh, we've been talking about the numbers that would be required for this, and the, the uh, current plan is 10,000 patients to go through the enrollment and biomarker collection. And that's going to require many more to, to start with. And 1,000 patients who don't have Dupuytren disease to act as controls. That's our, that's our target. To get those numbers, we're going through online sources. Um, we currently have, the foundation has about 6,000 patient emails on our mailing list, and we'll be doing a viral marketing to try to bump this up as well, mailing out waiting room brochures to the practices of hand surgeons and hand therapists around North America currently, wallet cards that you all got in your packs that you can hand to patients that has the website that they can sign up on. The link on the website, dupestudy.com, will bring them right now to an email enrollment form so that we can send out an email to them when the, the final study goes live. It's supposed to be live before this conference. And then the final thing is me talking to people, trying to get everyone to work together, because to pull this off as a collaborative international effort, I need your help. I'd like to ask all of you to refer your patients to dupestudy.com and have them refer their friends with Dupuytren disease to dupestudy.com. See me if you're interested in more card, wallet cards and goniometers. And tell me, what do you think ought to be surveyed? I haven't gone through the whole survey form for time constraints, but uh, I'm certainly uh, interested in what you think. What would you like done in terms of biospecimen collection? Because we're setting this up now. This is the ground level of doing this. And do you know a dupe spokesperson, who, a celebra dupe, who could improve the uh, uh, visibility of this project and be some kind of spokesperson? And I'm ha happy to talk about funding sources at any point. I, uh, I'm unemployed. I'm volunteering for this, and this is I'm running the foundation out of personal donations in my pocket, and so it's uh, uh, an issue, uh, and particularly for this research, which is going to add up very quickly. And so I'm very, I'm very grateful for you to uh, listen to what I've had to say, and I'm very interested in your thoughts. Thank you very much.